Okay, skin. No rain in January. The market is parched. All owls and stalls thin shade. Tables curl laden into form. Sugarcane grinders crank like oasis. Everything burns. Chairs, the dust. And we, unspared, move quickly through. At a corner, something stays the eye. Stiff, stretched, improbable. A light, faintly smelling. Yellow, unblemished, spotted, feline. Not large. Skin, stripped and cavernous. From this certain angle, casting a tall enough shadow to stalk twice across the sheet and back. Tiger, tiger, cousin twice removed, burning no less bright, lies never again to know the shrine of forest or of night. My mind closes round these words, a sputter of sense, and then none, for a moment, and then none. Nothing defies expectation, or should. Facts of men and murder hang clear. Here, yellowed fangs tell all. Fake teeth don't age. And there, proprietor hunter sits, last harvest, in the distance. Suspect guilty, first of need, and then of glaring want. The case is closed, and yet a skin remains. Black gold, fearful symmetry. The shock of seeing is gone. Now a gutted pang reinstates itself. How much, I ask? Not really curious. 5,000 kyats. Brusque reply. Sold for a meal, or perhaps not even. Here crops are small, families large. Difficult, and better not to know who will purchase the beast. But questions claw still into thought. Rug or hallway fixture. Sets are stuffed, and then, how well? Glass eyes, I imagine. Cotton tongue, a soft tail, spine, poise. All larger than life, and not forgetting. That smell, that snarl. Okay, uh, yeah. So when I when I began writing this poem, uh, which was a few days after I came back from Burma, it had already been five to six days after I first saw the skin hanging in Inside Market, and um, I I knew I wanted to write a poem about that encounter because, um, okay, I was traveling with my father, and after I saw the skin, I mentioned the skin to him, then he said. Hey, after that, you like a bit weird, weird like that. Yeah. So, so it must have moved me in some way that I didn't process at that time. So when I came back, I did want to write a poem about my encounter with this skin in the market, but I didn't really know how to start, and so um, I wrote the first stanza first, and that's about initial impressions of the market. No rain in January. I think um, the entire fact of the heat of the market struck me so much because. We were going to Burma expecting a winter, hilly kind of climate. And it was so hot. We only brought, okay, I only brought two t-shirts, my dad brought three. Okay? And these two, three t-shirts lasted us for the entire week because we couldn't bring ourselves to wear any of the winter clothing that we brought. So it, it was crazy. And, and it was really dry as well. Um, this is a, a hilly region, so it's really dry. And yeah, so no rain, the market is parched, um, tables curl, etc. Um, these are all initial impressions, and of course the sugar cane grinders, which we bought many drinks from. Yeah. Um, so after I wrote this first stanza, I didn't really know how to continue, whether I would go on to talk immediately about the skin, spend more time about describing the setting, or um, write a bit about my own mindset entering this market at this point. And to be very honest, I have no idea how I came to write the, the words that are now on the page. But um, consciously, uh, while writing this poem, I wanted to put down on paper my own chain of thought when seeing um, the skin. And so first, there are the visual impressions, stiff, stretched, improbable, alike, faintly smelling, yellow, unblemished, spotted, feline, not large, etc. These are the initial visual impressions of the skin. And it didn't look like any of the fake skins that I've seen because dried skin is, it's it's not it's not it's not bendy, it's not furry. The the hairs are actually coarse and the skin is stiff by this time. The tail was bent, and there was a bullet hole. Yeah, so it was unlike any of the skins that I thought I had seen before, which are of course fake skins, right? And the rugs you see on the floor they're all fake. So this particular skin um, occurred to me in that sense, but the main difference 
is in the large description, which was not large, because this skin was the the main thing that leapt out at me, um, metaphorically, from the skin was that it was it was small. It was smaller than I imagine a leopard skin to be after it's taken off a leopard, right? Normally, you in the zoo, the leopards are large. The skin is not, and it looked so deflated, because um, yeah, you think of a leopard stalking in a in a forest or wherever it happens to be stalking, and it's a huge, majestic animal. <laughs> it's the king of the forest if the lion is the king of the plain. But the skin is completely deflated. Um, it's completely powerless, dead, unmoving, right? And so those are the impressions that I wanted to capture in this second stanza, skin stripped and cavernous. Um, yeah. And, and, okay, yeah. and then after that, there's in the next stanza, the allusion to Tiger Tiger which many people have asked me about. Um, yeah. And for me, the, the lines of the original poem, Tiger Tiger Burning Bright, were actually what occurred to me first consciously after taking in the visual impressions of the skin. Yeah. And it's probably, um, I mean, it's because I love poetry and because I've, I've read poems like these that um, the lines managed to pop into my head first before any other conscious reaction to the tiger, I mean the, the tiger, leopard skin, yeah. So, um, yeah, but okay, as you can see here, the, the lines are then modified and the, of course the modification took place in my room when I was writing the poem after uh, being removed from the incident for a while. So I did remember that these, the lines of the original poem popped into my head first and I came home and then I added more to it. So I suppose when, um, when a poet comes into, or, or when any writer comes into contact with um, a situation that we are not very sure how to, what to do about, our first reactions will be whatever pops first into your head, right? But the, the processing only takes place later on at home. And it's in the processing that you, you try to make sense of whatever pops first into your head in a sense of um, like trying to tie it to the, the, the visual impressions that you've just taken in, etc. Um, yeah, so that was the next, next stage of my thought process. And then, um, yeah, and then after that, the rational side of me kicked in, as you can see. So um, I looked around for the murderer, and there he was, smoking a cigar, because uh, they, they grow tobacco in the, hill, in the hills there. And he was smoking a cigar, he was just sitting there. And I, I was shocked at that point, I mean, looking at the murderer and looking at the skin and the bullet hole, but I couldn't really tell why I was shocked because to be fair, nothing defies expectation. Um, they need to live, they are hunters, they kill animals, animals have skins, they sell skins, skins earn money, right? So nothing was supposed to defy expectation, nothing was supposed to shock me in that sense. Um, and which is why in the subsequent stanzas, I tried to go on a trail of what exactly was it that shocked me, right? And the case is closed and yet the skin remains. Um, yeah, and so I realized what was it actually that, that shocked me was um, how this was the first time I had to come to grips with um, the, the process that takes an animal skin from where it is alive and moving around in the forest and being, being I mean, doing what skins do, right, covering animals, to its place in a hallway or in the, the home of someone rich, um, perhaps as a couch draping or as a, some fixture. And so it was, I realized that it was having to come to grips with the actual process that shocked me because uh, it's something that we don't normally see. We somehow just expect uh, leopard skins or tiger skins to turn up in rich people's houses or in rich people's scarves or jackets. Yeah. Um, 